We are glad to welcome you to Lagos Media Launch for Meet the Farmers Conference 2019. For us, it's been a long journey yeah, across different cities in Africa, um, sort of like evangelizing, preaching the gospel of um, agriculture and agro exports, um, promoting agro trade, and um, um, resensitizing us, um, the press, stakeholders, the public, on um, our vision, our mission, and everything around Meet the Farmers Conference. Reiterating what we've done, our impact journey in, in, in the past um, three years now, and then also um, consolidating on the support we already have from many of you and see that we uh, again show our commitment to agriculture in Nigeria. All right, again, then we're glad to welcome you. So, very quickly now, we'll just um, do uh, a bit of. I, I, I especially welcome the press, members of the press, thank you for coming around. Um, our stakeholders, um, key stakeholders in business and agriculture, um, um, some of our partners that are here, you are welcome. Of course, we still have um, more time to get to know each other. It's going to be engaging, like my colleague said earlier. It's going to be really engaging. So we'll just begin with the introduction. My name is Antonio Awo. I write for Leadership Newspaper. Good morning, everyone. My name is Nancy Olive, and I'm with Connect Nigeria. Daniel Meshe, Business Text Edition is with Nasnira Falabi Abalaya, New Central. Thank you, everybody. My name is Mr. Ayo Uyose Baje, Nigeria's first technologist to work fully in the media, always with the business day on Sunday. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mirako Ebo, Compass Global Services. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jibona Uyede, the chairman of NYSA. Good morning, everyone. My name is Telecho Good morning. My name is Paul Obey Toba. I work for Compass Global Business Services. 
Good morning, my name is Adeumi Adi Toswe. I'm a farmer and I'm, and I'm representing farm tours, going to farm tours. Good morning, my name is Bojiba Yutosha, I'm the founder of Smart Farm Nigeria and um, the first winner of um, Agri Innovate Agri last year. Good morning everyone, Graham Leslie, I represent Dizengolf West Africa and happy to be here today. Good morning everyone, Gloria Peyoko for Washare Limited. Good morning everyone, my name is Amitai Benemi, I'm the sales partner for Good morning everybody, my name is Uzvan and I work with Connect Nigeria. Good morning, everyone. I'm Akadim Victor from Daily Trust. My name is Mr. Olabumi John. I'm sending you the government. I'm so many of you who are here today. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Aki Alabi of Public Farmers International. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Samor. Uh, I work with the Zen government here. Good morning. I'm Bola Idili. I work with Queen of It Consulting. Again, uh, the Meat Farmers Conference is something that started um, three years ago. Um, it's an initiative of Crenove Consulting. Um, essentially, what we're trying to do is to um, connect the um, African food market to the supply, to the demand from the GCC region. Last year, 2018, we, didn't, we did not only hold media launch events, we also held actual events in four major African cities, Lagos, Kigali, Nairobi, um, Accra, right, before we then went on to the grand finale in Dubai. And we had a pretty um, interesting time together um, with the different attendees, exhibitors, sponsors, partners. Um, last year, um, at about this time, sometime in July, we had the media launch and we had um, some stakeholders in attendance. So we see that it's, it's an entire journey. This year alone, we've been to different other cities holding um, media and um, public engagements like this, fielding questions, um, interacting with the public about our goals, our visions, and all the things that we have in stock regarding Meet the Farmers Conference. Right? Um, I would not be able to say as much as um, some of my other colleagues who would come and um, present. They would, uh, they would explain in, in better details the um, objectives and mission, vision behind the Meet the Farmers Conference. Let's plan together as we work on. Um, Chidi Udabala for um, the United States. Thank you very much, Obatini. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome once again to this official launch and the media briefing of Meet the Farmers Conference. With this meeting, we hope to communicate to you the objectives um, and the goals behind this idea, Meet the Farmers Conference. So our short term goal is providing a platform where um, potential OS stakeholders can leverage on to play strongly in the UAE markets and the GCC in general. And then of course the long term goal is increased industrialization of agriculture based businesses in Nigeria and Africa. We'll also be deliberating on how the conference will help promote agro trade between Nigeria and of course Africa and then the GCC, UAE in particular. Of course, this achievement, you can agree, will translate to strategic foreign direct investment into the Nigerian and African countries. Um, we'll also throw more light on how stakeholders, everybody that are here today, um, how, how you play in the agri value chain from the pre-planting processes, planting processes, harvest post-harvest processes, logistics, how it contributes to the GDP of Nigeria as a country. Now, a brief overview of um, the agro space. Now in Nigeria, we have 36.6% uh, of the Nigerian population that's engaged in subsistence agriculture in 2017. That is about 90 million people of the about 200 million people that we have in Nigeria. This goes to show that we are really making sure, on, uh, the government is really trying, uh, making sure this promise of diversifying the Nigerian economy from oil to the other sectors of the economy with agriculture being the pilot sector and others to the line. Nigeria is the world's number one producer of cassava. Now, um, being the number one producer of cassava in the world, we have really not maximized these efforts that we have put in because 
we are currently not the number one exporter of cassava in the world. Yes. So there is a lot of potential here, and we are just still talking about cassava. Now, it may interest us to know that um, recently, due to innovations in technology too, um, there has been a development of bioplastic bags, and it is made from cassava. It is just made from cassava starch, vegetable oil, and organic resins, and these are biodegradable. So imagine when governments will start taking conscious efforts to move from polyethylene, which we have, we can all agree that it pollutes our environment indefinitely, to bioplastic uh, bio bags that are biodegradable, both online and on tape. And that is just one potential from cassava alone. And we have a lot of other produces that can be harnessed. Now, Nigeria has about 30 million hectares of farmland that are under cultivation season to season. That is to tell you that we have the capacity to grow, we have the capacity to export. Africa has the capacity to feed the world. Now, a brief look at this slide will get to see the agro-export industry in Nigeria. Some of the popularly exported products from Nigeria to the world will have cocoa beans, standing at 1.4%. We'll have the rose tobacco at 0.23%. We'll have the cocoa butter. Now, um, I, because of time, I will not be running through all of this. But um, if uh, we have the soft copies of these slides available, so let's just focus. At the end of the conference, those minutes will be able to share it with you. Now, promoting agribusiness in Nigeria. Of course, we all know that the Nigerian government is making conscious efforts of diversifying the Nigerian economy. We are moving away from oil because in the near future, technologies are coming up that is making oil more obsolete. Yeah, so we need to diversify to stay relevant in the uh, coming future as far as uh, FDI is, in, is involved. Now, um, from the agriculture uh, promotion policy, from 2016 to 2020, it aims to, uh, to meet domestic food needs, boost exports, and promote job creation. Of course, through some incentives by the federal government, through um, agencies like the BOI Bank of Industry, CBN, they have made funds available for people that are starting up in the farming industry to have access to, to it and then be able to play in the sector. This is commendable. Now we have increased budgetary allocation of up to 118 billion in 2018, and it is aimed at promoting agricultural productivity. This is also projected to go above this in subsequent years. Of course, the Federal Ministry of Agriculture is importantly involved in a nationwide advocacy on agricultural quality control and standardization to improve Yes, this is very key because meeting standards is one of the things that we currently have and we're seeking to address as far as uh, exports is concerned. Now, the Nigerian market and the agroeconomy. A lot of us are familiar with the information here. Of course, Nigeria is 200 million people strong with the projections uh, made to grow to 258 million by 2030. Um, there are over 30 million hectares of farmland under cultivation season to season. And then, 36 point, about 90 million people are currently engaged in one form of, of the agribusiness or the other. Now, if there is an interesting fact at the bottom of that slide. Nigeria ranks sixth worldwide and first in Africa in farm output. Now, um, the reason why some of us may um, find this a bit difficult to believe is because we have not yet maximized these landmarks that we have broken in terms of exports. And I believe that uh, with this uh, idea that we have, the truth that we believe that Africa can feed the world will be achieved if we collaborate and work together. Now, um, this is a brief um, glance at the export and import in Nigeria. And um, if we look at the export partners that Nigeria currently has, India tops the list at 8.25 billion, followed by the United States, followed by Spain, followed by France, followed by Netherlands. And bulk of these exports are oil. So where does agriculture come in? So that shows us immediately at a glance that there is a huge potential for those playing in the agri-export industry. Now, a quick look at that equally tells you that the UAE is not even there. We are not currently playing strongly in the UAE market. And we have a large potential in the UAE market, they import over 80% of the food products that they consume there, and it is worth over $100 billion, and we're talking yearly. We're not playing there. 
So there's a huge potential to meet there. Then of course our import partners, we, if we check the trade deficit, uh, the trade balance, we are still in the deficit because we import more than we export. So hopefully with that record we can balance this trade deficit. It is very possible. Next slide. So some of the top exported products um, from Nigeria include, of course, crude petroleum, standards 36.9 billion dollars, petroleum gas 6.47 billion dollars, French petroleum. Now, this is the first agro product on the slide. And we can see the difference between this and even the next. It's more than 100 million dollars. So there is a lot of room to grow. There's a lot of capacity to grow. There's a lot of needs to be met. Now, um, cocoa beans and cassava are some of the most imported agro-produce in the GCC region, the Gulf Corporation Council states, of which UAE is an important part of. And we've already established that cassava, we are the biggest output. Uh, we've produced the most amount of cassava in the world. And cocoa beans is another um, product that we, agro-produce that we play strongly in. Now, we are equally second largest producer of sorghum in the world, and we're the largest producer of rice in Africa, and the second largest producer of sesame seed after Ethiopia. Now, if you look at the index and further research, I've seen that even Ethiopia is playing more strongly than we are in the export market, even though we are doing quite well in the production of this sesame seed. Now, um, there's a lot of, like I keep saying, if we collaborate and with the idea that MTFC offers, that's made the farmers conference, we can actually step up and take our rightful position as leaders of agro-produce exports in Africa. Nigeria colonies in yam and cassava, of course I've mentioned this before, and hibiscus flour exported to Mexico and Russia. Now, um, if we look at the world of agro-industry, if we take a glance at this slide, you can see that year on year, the agro-industry has grown. This is a report from World Bank. Uh, so in, 20, in 2016, we agri the agri-sector contributed 24.40% of the GDP. 2017, it rose to 25.10. 2018, it rose marginally to 25.40. Projections show that it, it will rise significantly this year. Now, the Nigerian government, of course, continues to make concerted efforts to improve um, agriculture and agribusiness. And this, of course, can translate to um, foreign direct investment into the country. Now, this is a brief swap analysis of the Nigerian agro industry. One of our major strengths is that we have affordable labor, that is, well below high income and some middle income earners. A lot of us here are already in the sector, so we can really agree with this without talking much on it. Uh, of course, we have one of the best land for cultivation of agro, of food and agro produces. Now, we have large capacity for production, and of course, we have large capacity for processing and industrialization because we have the numbers. Uh, well, some of our weaknesses include lack of knowledge and um, technical uh, assistance to subsistence farmers. Yes, because many people that are playing in the agro sector are not aware of the current trends. I happened to be speaking with uh, somebody, I will not mention the name for some obvious reasons. So he played strongly in the tomato industry. And when we got to talking, he told me that one of the challenges is that we don't stay up to trends because, take for instance, the species of tomatoes that we currently plant are not, the, are not what our contemporaries outside are planting. So what we plant has majority of water in it. So when you now start processing, you find out that you spend more energy trying to extract the water. And before you can get the base, you would have spent a lot of ink and resources on just processing. And you end up with reduced yield. So um, because we lack this information, because we have this technology, uh, lack of technological advancement, it still draws us back. And it's still a weakness that we seek to add, uh, address with this mid performance conference. Now, of course, um, we can see that over 40% of our harvest perish because we don't have adequate, uh, adequate storage and uh, processing facilities. This is really, really a problem that has eaten deep into the pockets of our farmers. And I hope with the collaboration, with the uh, ideas of Mid Farmers Conference, when we get to collaborate with the international community and they start to invest in Africa via this um, 
providers and facilities or gets to solve this problem. Now, lack of infrastructure causes delays in the logistics of harvested crops from farmlands to major markets in the cities. This is a problem we keep grappling with because some of our farmlands are way, way removed from, our, from the major urban cities where we live. And then yeah, the roads to those places are terrible. So even when you to the major cities, it's another problem that we grapple with. But then, these, I believe, are weaknesses that we can overcome if we put the right things into place. Now, some of the opportunities that we've equally identified in the Nigeria's agro-industry includes a number of agro-tech startups are developing tech-enabled farming solutions of which um, one of our own smart farms is here, are coming up with many innovative solutions to make farming very, very seamless and to equally increase, increase yield. Nigeria is also well positioned for profiting from the recently signed Africa Free Continental Trade Agreement. Of course, um, with the recent policies that the government are making, we have favorable policies that encourage local production of agro-produces. Now, some of our trades, of course, um, will continue to experience uh, trade, uh, will not experience trade balance in agricultural trade if domestic products and processing industries are not encouraged, like we have established before, because we lack these processing and storage facilities, we keep losing yield. Uh, to pest deterioration and all that, because incessant civic unrest, over reliance on importation of processed foods would definitely, and uh, we can attest to that, hinder economic growth in Nigeria. Some of the top imported agro products into the UAE. Now, uh, we've categorized this into we have the softs, we have the coffee, of course, this is a uh, the products imported into the UAE are not limited to this, but this is just for the, uh, the purpose of this. Now, have the salt, coffee, cocoa, uh, cocoa, sugar, and tea. Have the grains, wheat, rice, corn maize, barley, oats. Have the edible nuts, almonds, and the rest. Um, when we share the slides, we can go through. Um, agro products imported by DCC countries. And then, of course, the import value. Now, cereals, uh, preserved fruits and vegetables stand uh, out as the most at 2.846, and it is valued at 4.3 billion dollars yearly. Cereals um, is second place at 2.68 percent, and it's valued at 4.03 billion dollars. Now, a quick glance at these figures will show you the potentials that we are talking about. This is a lot of money. This is the kind of money that we should be making for Nigeria and for Africa. And we can increase this capacity. It's like. So some of the opportunities in the UAE agro industry, one, we, uh, the UAE has, um, of one of many things that they have achieved is establishing an open trade policy with the many free trade zones that they have, where you can even own your business up to 100%. And of course, um, Imports uh, carry out trade activities without having to pay duties in the free zones. It has really, really made um, making business in the UAE quite easy and seamless. Um, there is no doubt UAE is one of the top destinations, top everything almost in the world now, um, Dubai in particular. So we have uh, one of the best infrastructure and logistics available. Yeah, because um, I can tell you for a fact that it takes less than 24 hours to clear your goods when you import into the UAE. Uh, uh, access to the MENA region, that is the Middle East and the North Africa region, with a growing population of food demand. So Dubai, because of its strategic project, uh, positioning uh, geographically, they, they can assess other markets. And what, when we go further down this slide, you can see a chart where we, uh, we establish the fact that 70% of the total goods that are imported into the UAE are re-exported to the surrounding regions positioning Dubai as a major trade hub in that region. And they have, of course, functioning ports and warehouses with top-of-the-world facilities, wider market reach as a member of the Gulf Corporation Council, and um, the conducive financial and business environment resulting to, the, uh, resulting to ease of doing business. The opportunities now, UAE is an arid land, like we know, so they import 80% of its food needs. Now, the current imports to the UAE is worth over $100 billion, like I earlier stated, and it is expected to rise to $400 billion in the next 
six years. And that is a lot of potential. Dubai is a exporting hub to other GCC countries. Like I said, they are strategically positioned geographically, and then 70% of total imported products are re exported to the neighboring GCC countries. Because there are lots of free, zone, a trade, a free trade zones in Dubai that can make your own business easy. And uh, Dubai and other Emirates within the UAE are developing rapidly into a more organized city, attracting more, more multinational brands. Dubai is like the world's top uh, tourism destination now. And uh, Dubai is the second most visited city after New York in the world. Now, this is a lot of people coming into Dubai. And of course, people have one basic need, and that need is to eat. No matter where you buy in the world, you will eat. Dubai gets this population, because this population will be fed. Now, who provides this food? Africa. And I keep saying it, Africa can feed the world, and Africa will feed the world. Next slide. So, Queen of it, Queen of it. So this is who we are, Queen of it. MTFC is the brainchild of Queen of it. And meet the Farmers Conference, that is MTFC, is as a result of a research that we carried out in 2016, and then we noted that there is a gap that needs to be filled as far as the agro business is concerned with respect to the UAE. Now, what we do basically is we're a management consulting firm and we offer, we ideas and we offer business solutions to government agencies, enterprises, and um, we facilitate trade between regions. Our, our major focus, like I said, our short term goal is to create a platform where Africa, where we can facilitate trade between regions in Africa and the GCC uh, company, uh, GCC countries. Our about the Farmers Conference. Uh, this conference is quite unique because it goes further to just bringing people together to facilitating trade. We have had success stories in the past where um, we've had people that partnered with those that came from Nigeria and established businesses already. Now our aim is to connect the agro community to directly to have access to the UAE market. And um, of course we all know the conference will be for two days coming up in November. And um, we are sure, quite sure, that these years will be bigger than what we had before. The aim remains to create sustainable business partnerships across borders. Our premise, like I said before, we believe that Africa can feed the world. And how can we achieve this? Once we are able to promote our agro-trade partnership across borders, this can be quite a, an easy venture. Now, the opportunity you stand to get, once you, um, uh, it goes without saying, you get to network, you get to build business relationships, you get to establish uh, business contacts, and of course you get to equally learn the trends that are in the industry, you get to learn what is working and what is not. Yes. So, um, for Africa, what made the Farmers Conference start to get is, number one, first and foremost, foreign direct investment to contribute to our goal of economic diversity, to improve that bilateral trade and country relationships. Because um, before we can export, uh, we need to comply to international standards. And then once we can incre uh, increase uh, agro-trade relations, it goes without saying that we're equally increasing our awareness to comply to international standards, which will further agro-trade. And of course, uh, drive innovation in agriculture to optimize production. Now, if we look at this slide, at this uh, paragraph, we can see that every year Africa exports over 35 billion worth of agro-produce to other parts of the world. And this figure is expected to rise to 400 billion by 2050. So, currently, um, in the next 31 years, Africa is expected to export up to 400 billion. But in the next six years, UAE will be needing the same 400 billion worth of agro-produce. So what are we waiting for? Why don't we latch onto this opportunity and capitalize? Next slide. So um, our focus, uh, the year's Meet the Farmers Conference, of course, this year's theme for Meet the Farmers Conference is creating a sustainable future. We started this journey in 2017, and our focus then was the future of agribusiness with emphasis on agro-trade activities, export uh, promotion, technology innovation in agriculture across Africa. 
Now this year we are looking at food security, trade, and technology. And it's anchored on our big vision to sustain global food production by facilitating trade. Now why you should attend, I mentioned some of this before, of course you get to participate in conversations and get to learn the current trends that are working, you get to understand what people in your industry are doing that you should start doing, or you get to, of course, position your brand as an international brand, when you get to make business alliances, when you start exporting, because you're no, no, no more local, you're now global, um, you get to network and build strategic business partnerships on a global scale. So this is our journey this year um, in trying to sensitize and create awareness for this conference. Now, it started in March, 23rd of March, uh, in Ethiopia, we've been to Ethiopia, we've been to Namibia on the 27th of April, to Kenya, Ghana, now Nigeria. And of course, you see this is a lot of journey, this is a lot of coverage, and um, we are one company. Um, we really cannot um, do this without your support. So that is why we crave your support and your sponsorship to keep this dream of Africa feeding the world alive. So um, a brief uh, look at a brief look at the summary of the conference. It will be taking place in November, 27th and 28th, at the Address Hotel Dubai Marina, um, from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Of course, the conference style is uh, exhibition, attending, conference, and networking. If you want further information about this at the end of the conference, you can talk to any of my wonderful colleagues. You can see them in a brunette shirt. Next slide. So, like I said, um, for modes of participation at the conference, you can choose to just attend, network, make your business contacts. You can choose to exhibit. And for exhibition, you get to have your stand, exhibition stands, and it will be branded with your company logo and you can come with samples of your produce so that people can, at one glance, you know, have a feel of what you are offering. And of course, there is, it goes without saying that you can close businesses for you on the spot. And for sponsorship, that is what we really need. And what it offers for you is not just um, us participating, exhibiting and all that. We equally take you with us to all the countries that we will be going for the mini launch of this event. Our official partners include Ethiopian Airline, UAE Africa, Travels and Click, the DMCC, that is the biggest trade zone in the GCC con uh, countries, and of course for media and fan crowding. Uh, past sponsors, fan crowding, Joe Travels, Wawani, and of course a lot of other people that are coming on board still. Now, um, I believe we have been able to, at least um, in a slight way, show you some of the potentials that the agrospace in Africa has with regards to exporting to the UAE. And there is ample opportunity for us to latch onto and then to develop our capacity to grow, especially in the field of agribusiness. We will be most grateful to you if you can grace us with your presence for this conference, because like I said and I keep saying, Africa can feed the world, and Africa will feed the world, but we will not be able to do this without collaborating. Ours is to provide the platform, yours is to latch on and take advantage. We believe that Africa can feed the world. Partner with us to make this a reality. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you again, Chile, and thank you all for listening. Um, we're quite sure that um, some of, especially the farmers here, uh, may have had questions on their mind. This market, how can we access this market? What do I need? Um, how how easy is it? Yeah. So I have in another very short presentation. I have um, Toby, another um, colleague of mine, who will do justice to that. He will be presenting on the procedures to export to the UAE. He will focus on the UAE market. This market in the UAE. What is it about? What can we do? How can we be part of it? Uh, please welcome to the show that we're bringing it. Please put your hands together. Um, thank you, Chidi, for that interesting presentation. We know our strengths as a nation, but those staggering figures got me wondering if um, we would, you know, get on board and take.
advantage of this initiative. We know what Nigeria can do. We've always had the potential. The question is, can we really do that? And that is why we're all gathered here today. Okay, so I'll be taking us through the export procedures. We already established um, some moments ago that agriculture employs over 1 billion people around the world, and that turns into $3.2 trillion worth of revenue, and, and that turns to $3.2 trillion worth of revenue. This is a global industry. It encourages not just um, the farmers or the producers, it's Brings, um, and it brings labor into play as well. And you can see the figure, that was from World Bank, and that is something we can really lash onto. And the UAE, as we said earlier, they import over $100 billion worth of agro-commodities yearly, which in turn aligns with our goal as a consulting firm in the UAE to you know, facilitate at least 1% of these of these hundred billion dollars from Nigeria and Africa as a whole. Um, however, there is an interesting thing about Dubai, and like my colleague said, how they are strategically positioned. They import 80%, like he explained earlier, but not all of this is consumed by them. They, start, they, 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 they stand as a re-exporting of, yes, to say, to other GCC countries, to the Bahrains, to the Romans, and the Kuwait. So they've been positioned to actually be the logistics or the trade of of the GCC area. That is why you see Dubai keeps welcoming people every day. It keeps going on and on and on. Um he ran through this already. Um it's in no news that we export. Yes, we know that we export, but I think these figures are not really encouraging in terms of our potentials and arable land and the rest. He said we have cocoa beans, raw tobacco and the likes. But after this gathering, I believe these um, commodities can be more and this percentage will increase as well because now that we know we have the potential, it is the ball is in our court, so to speak, to seize and lash onto this initiative. Now, required documents for exporting to the UAE. We, when we talk about exportation, it's not something that is rocket science. It's just, you know, sensible. I have food here, someone there needs it over there. And the encouraging thing about Dubai is the government have, they put a lot of things in place, you know, just to reduce the trade barriers with other communities, especially agro. Whatever is coming for agro, they have special, they've done special things to make it, you know, to ease people through the market. So what will be required from you is the country of origin certificates approved by the country of origin chamber of commerce, which we have Nasima or the Lagos Chamber of Commerce can do. Your health certificates because we are advocating for you know good quality control, animal and health inspection service as well. The people that kill um, cows and goats are not left out. This is for processed meats. Then your bill of entry or airway bill and your parking list for people who will be exporting processed and packaged products. And this is a description of what a processed packaged product will look like. Of course, you need the Arabic translation for the mother tongue over there because their predominant language is Arabic, so we need to comply with that. The description of the products, product brand name, of course. The production and expiry dates, we don't want to export goods that will hurt people. I mean, it is still human beings that are consuming these commodities, and we want to give our continent a good name as well. The ingredients and the country of origin as well. Then the net content weight in metric tons, I need to know the weight of what I'm buying. Then going to the container and box package labeling requirements, country of origin comes into play as well. The details of the producer, that is you, which is a good thing for you. Imagine um, one of us, you know, just walking down the street of Dubai and I go into a supermarket and I see maybe smart farms now. Wow, she's exporting. This is really good. That is, you know, representing Africa, so to speak, in this market that we are telling you about. 
detail of the vendors required, special preparation and storage instruction, approval from the Ministry of Healthcare before making health claims, and your lot identification as well. Then the customs, what they need for you, from you rather, over there is the import certificate from the municipality of Dubai, visual inspection to ensure compliance with labeling and shelf life. While it is important to know something, we as a management consulting firm, we advise people that are looking to explore these markets to set up in the free trade zone because what comes in into the free trade zone is always duty free. We have the Amarina Free Trade Zone, and my colleague Ewa have mentioned DMCC, which is the largest free trade zone in Nigeria. Then, this is the flow process of what I just described. Like I said, you get your documents, and you move them. Prior to your vessel arriving, you submit your bill of lading. Of course, most of the importers in the room are familiar with that. Then, your delivery order to be received from the shipping agency as well. Then, you log on to the Dubai Trade to create and submit the import declaration application for Dubai. And for those of us that import, we are familiar with our Nigeria Customs from M, if you're importing. This is equivalent of that in Dubai over there. Now, this whole process may look rigorous and all, but I promise you it is not. That is why we, as a management consulting firm, as we said, we are here to you know, facilitate this trade. All you have to do is just come to us who will advise you on how best to go about these things step by step and you can relax and guarantee that you will get what your commodity is worth in the market. Now, the questions that we normally encounter from people during these sensitization events are what is the rate of custom duty in Dubai? Yes, that is 5% of the value in cost in freight insurance. Then what document does the custom require to permit imported goods into the free trade zone. Of course, your delivery order, original invoice, certificate of origin, which I explained earlier, the custom duty received, and the duty exemption certificate. Now, who will be responsible to claim the cargo from the customs in Dubai? That is the consignor holding a UAE or Dubai Economic Department license. And agents as well in Dubai Economic Department that are into clearing and forwarding. What documents do I require to clear goods at the customs? Of course, the commercial invoice from the supplier, the parking list, certificate of origin, delivery order, bill of lading, whether sea or land. Then how can I find a UAE agent or distributor for my products? That is where Creative Consulting comes into play as well. Like my colleague said earlier, we are a management consulting firm. It was after, after the market research and visibility study that we identified this gap, and now we are coming back to Nigeria to tell our people that this market is very large. It's a market they can represent Africa in very well. And for most of the top off takers in Dubai, just to mention a few, Just to mention a few, we have the Mighty Leaf Tree, Food Specialist Limited, and the Barriera Foods. Like I said, if you are interested in this, we can just send you a copy for your pleasure, and I believe it will go a long way in helping you disseminating this information. Now, this, this is the um, interesting part, like I would say, why Dubai? I'm sure that's the lingering question in all of our minds, why Dubai? As I explained earlier, 80% of what they eat is imported. So why not to buy instead? And the figure is only going to grow to 400 billion in the next six years. So imagine a quarter of this money coming into the African community. It's really grow a long way in helping us achieve some of our goals. Then the free trade zone opportunities that I explained earlier, it is a serious advantage that people who are looking to set up in Dubai can really take advantage of. Then Dubai is regarded as an export, trade, and logistics hub of the world. My colleague said Dubai welcomes the second city that welcomes the largest people in the world. And if you look at it practically, there is no asking ourselves any other questions. These people are going to eat. If they keep welcoming these people, which correlates with this figure we're talking about, 
it is only going to go up in the coming years. And Africa should be playing a leading role. Not just Africa, Nigeria should be playing a leading role in terms of food exportation into the UAE. Now, the infrastructure, logistics, and technology advanced system availability. Um, this is quite interesting as well. I stumbled on something recently which has been implemented. The Dubai government is going to be adopting blockchain technology in its seaports and its land spot, you know, just to ease people that are bringing things in and clearing, to make it more seamless for them. By 2020, they projected that there will be a smarter city, you know, working fully on blockchain technology. So these are the advantages that you have in Dubai if you are looking to explore the opportunities in this market. And the ease of doing business, of course, it cannot be overemphasized. As it currently stands, they are 11th in the world when it comes to ease of doing business. And Dubai will host Expo 2020. Now, this is an interesting thing to note down. Expo 2020 is a gathering of world population. The, Dubai will be hosting the world, basically, for six good months. But I don't know about you, but me, I can't go without food for two days, so these people will be consuming a lot. So these figures are just starting to um, move up with. Now, what is the way forward for these challenges? We need to comply with global standard. We need to, you and I, we need to comply with that. We are representing our country and our continent, so we have to comply with global standard. Then the pricing strategy as well. It has to be in line with the international market price of agro commodities. That is very essential as well. Yeah. So now, what can we do to reduce this? We need collaboration and strategic partnerships with the UAE and African banks to come together and form some sort of synergy that will be good enough for the farmers. Of course, when he exports his commodity, he's expecting his money, and there won't be delay from the other party over there as well. Now, in conclusion, like I was stressed earlier, we, after going through this presentation, you've seen agriculture, the number of people it employs, and the people that can be fed, and the revenue that can be generated. Now, the question is, what are we going to do with this power that is in the hands of the farmers? We, everyone here, gathered in this room, we have a major role to play. This um, agro business that we're talking about, if probably a nest, it's going to create more employment, it's going to feed more people, and in turn, better our economy as a continent and as a nation as well. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, so I'm sure we're more enlightened um, about um, the procedures for uh, exporting to the UAE and by extension, other Gulf um, cooperation countries. Um, these presentations will be available, and other presentations from today, even the videos will be available to um, us in the uh, post-event uh, communication. So the rest actually, you can get it from us, you can get it from any of the um, contact people we have around. All right, without further ado, we just press on. We have with us um, from Lagos Chamber of Commerce, uh, Dr. Matthew Ujo is the Director for Policy and Advocacy at the Lagos Chamber of Commerce and Industry. It's going to make a statement on um, what they do at um, Lagos Chamber of Commerce and their form of their point of synergy with um, Meet the Farmers Conference. Please put your hands together to welcome you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, on behalf of the President of uh, Lagos Chamber of Commerce and Industry, uh, Mr. Babatunde Paul Ruashe, and the Director General, Mr. Muda Alisu, I want to congratulate Pinovit for this wonderful idea started in 2017. For us, it's a laudable uh, in, uh, initiative, and just as their name goes by, it's not only creative, it's also innovative. So we thank them for this, and we want to make them understand that we are ready. Uh, they have brought us on board as uh, their technical partner, and we want to 
I show them that we play active role, a very active role in this year's mid farmers conference. For us in LCCI, we, as you, some of you already know, we our goal is to promote and to protect the interest of our members. And of course, we don't have individual members, we have corporate members. And we have up to 22, now 23 sectoral groups. And one of the most active sectoral groups we have uh, is the Agro Allied uh, Group. And this fits perfectly well into what the group is all about. That is on on the side of LCCI. For me, as an agricultural economist and also as an agribusiness specialist, this is very interesting to me and it's my field. And I'm really happy that we have an opportunity to push uh, the Nigeria agricultural sector uh, further than what it has always been. Uh, we thank God that over the years, like you saw when the slides were being presented, the contribution of the sector to, to the GDP has been on the increase. I've also had the opportunity of working with the farmers at the rural level. And if I say rural, I mean very, very rural. Because I used to be a program manager for rural development program uh, of an NGO in New York State. And I know that one of the challenges that these rural farmers face constantly is access to market. Anything you tell them, you bring uh, new varieties, uh, by the way, for, for, for crops, is variety. For animals, is species. So we don't use species for crop. Now, when you get new varieties or improved varieties from IITA and you push down uh, this to the, to the farmers, they are always willing to adopt. But the next question you most, you very often will hear from them is, where do I sell it to? If you give me this new thing, where do I push it to? So for me, it's, it's a very uh, interesting opportunity for farmers to know that they can plant locally, but sell globally. And that is the, the, the direction we all want to push the agricultural sector. If, if we are being told that the agricultural sector in 2018 was what one fourth of the Nigerian GDP, I think that is a plus for the sector. And for us at LCCI, we want to push the interest of those in the agricultural sector. And mind you, this is not only going to affect the farmers, because what is produced in agriculture is also raw material for so many industries in the country. So beyond uh, selling things or, or moving our, our produce out, we also will be developing our industries when we have enough raw materials. The only encouragement we also want to give our farmers is when you import or I mean when you export raw you get less value. If you add value you get more from it. So the quality and the standard as it has been uh, mentioned has to be right. So we are glad to be on board with uh, Crenovate and uh, like the president already gave uh, you his assurances we will be uh, happy to actively play our part and also bring on board our members to participate at the Meet the Conference, uh, Meet the Farmers Conference in Dubai this come uh, November. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah, thank you very much, sir. Uh, so because of our time, we'll just um, take the different statements from the uh, different stakeholders present. So right about now, we have um, representatives from the Ministry of Women Affairs and Poverty Alleviation, Lagos State Government. Uh, we have the Director for Poverty Alleviation, Mr. Ogaminka Kendi. They're going to give us their endorsement and also what the Ministry is doing regarding uh, food production. Of course, food is, uh, food is, the Yoruba people will say, ti, edibati, koronino, ishe, ishe, That's, when you take food off, Poverty, what is left is just is just small. So food production is key in poverty alleviation and we have um, representatives from the Lagos State Ministry of Poverty Alleviation and Women Affairs to um, say a few things about what they do and um, their points of synergy with Middle Farmers Conference 2019. Thank you very much. Please put your hands together for Mr. Obunin Thank you very much. All protocols will be observed. 
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, like I've been introduced, I'm Ogwin Kake, the Director of Poverty Alleviation at the Ministry of Women Affairs and Poverty Alleviation, the State. They were happy to be here with Renovate, uh, and we are partnering with them because we are aware of what they have been doing and what they intend to do. For our ministry, the little tool that we have been doing over the years is women affairs and what we basically do is to train women in farming activities and empower them. In order to achieve this, the ministry has a small space of 45 hectares of land train the women and we empower them. We give them space to be able to practice what they learn, what we have taught them, and they produce, and whatever that comes in from there, they take away. We do follow up for them with, uh, because Lagos State has a, um, an agency that gives lands to people, that is uh, Agricultural Land Holding Authority. We link them up to Agricultural Land Holding Authority where they will be given large space of land to continue practicing. Well, on our own part, having trained them, we allow them to stay on our farm for a season, for a season, two, two seasons, one year, to be able to show us that what they learn, they are able to practice it. After which, we pass them to a great land holding authority for them to have permanent farmlands. And over the years, we have been training at least 150 women every year in the last five years. We have been training them in farming activities from production, processing, and even take them up to marketing. And in the area of cassava production, maize, vegetables, oil palm, oil palm processing, cassava processing to produce cassava and gari to produce fufu and the rest products from cassava. We also take them through uh, livestock, uh, particularly slay rearing, uh, grass, grass cutter rearing, and in some cases, fish farming. These are, these are just the little area that the ministry has been contributing to food production in the in the state. We hope to do more. And um, this year, the scope has been expanded, and we hope to bring in more women to train for the last part of the year, which is the second part, second season of the year. And this is uh, why we also want to uh, come along with partner and uh, partner with renovate so that our women in the states will be able to enjoy the the facilities. Thank you. So we are still expecting to train more. We in our uh, activity, it's not only fresh, but we also do advanced training for those, for some women who are already in the business to give them advanced technologies concerning uh, farming. So it's not only uh, freshers that we take on to train, but we also give advanced training to women. We, the ministry, being women affairs of ministry, we have other areas that we impact people in the state. We have uh, training centers all across the state, which we call skill acquisition centers. Right now, we have 18 centers across the state. So we are hoping to do this year to create four more. And we are also doing uh, other things. In domestic violence, uh, we are also involved to make sure that the women in the state are not violated. Be you a farmer 
or whatever you may be, the Ministry of uh, Women Affairs and Poverty and Education is doing a lot to make sure that anyone who violates a woman is brought to book and given the rightful judgment. The Ministry in its capacity is also creating a transition home where the violated will be kept for a while before they go back to their normal life. So these are just the little things that we've been doing in the ministry. And concerning agriculture, like I have said, we will be doing more for the people, for, the, for women in the in the state. In partnering with the Chronovit, we will not relent in doing this so that we can touch more lives of women in the state. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much for um, believing and supporting the Medi Farmers Conference vision. All right, um, talking about believing and supporting the Medi Farmers Conference vision, uh, right from last year, we've had uh, Farm Crowdy, now Farm Crowdy Group, uh, the largest um, digital agricultural platform in Nigeria. I mean, I feel like all of us in this room, literally all of us know. Farm crowd, they, they were sponsors, they were with us all the way last year from Nigeria to Ghana to Dubai, you know, and um, we've received immense support from them. We're glad to have them here and also uh, with us again um, this year. And um, we have with us, we have with us um, co founder and um, CEO at um, Farm Crowdy Group, Tokwe Omotolani. She'll be giving a statement and also telling us how. The point of synergy between Pam Crowley, of course, and um, Little Farmers One. Please put your hands together for okay. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's an honor to be here. Well done, Bola. Well done to everyone. Um, we are excited at Farm Crowley to partner with Queen of Eight, and I'll tell you one major reason why. Um, for me, is to see a lot of young people leaving the shores of Nigeria to go to other countries and create a way for Nigeria there. And that's what they are simply doing. Um, it's easy for the young people like us to travel and you forget what you have in your country, but they go out there and they go to create path and they are calling Nigerians to come up with this opportunity so that we can expand what we are doing. And for that, I really, really salute their courage. Please. One more time, let me give a round of applause to the um, team. Farm Crowdy, um, as you all know, we are the first um, digital agricultural platform in Nigeria that allows everyday Nigerians to sponsor farmers across different parts of Nigeria. Um, we launched in 2016, and um, since we've launched, we've worked in over 13 states, um, working with over 11,000 farmers across um, different um, value chain. Uh, our major focus is to production and trading for now. Uh, we've worked with farmers that plant rice, maize, soya beans, ginger. Um, we've done poultry farm. Of, uh, we've run over 1.5 million birds already on our platform. 2.5, I'm so sorry, 2.5 million birds already on our platform and um, worked with over 11,000 farmers. And this are, uh, our, area, our major area of focus is mainly providing access to funds for farmers. We all know that not every farmer can walk into a bank and access loan. Um, so what we do is to create, uh, provide access to funds by getting everyday Nigerians to go on our platform just the way you shop on Konga or Jumi and all of that. You just go there on our platform click on the number of farmers, uh, farms you want to sponsor, and you make your payment online. After your payment is done, you start getting updates on what is happening on your farm, videos, pictures, and at the end of your farming cycle, you get to share profit with the farmers. So the farmers make profit, you also make profit, and we make profit. So it's simply put, it's a way of empowering people and making profit while you do it. So it's doing good and earning money at the same time. Um, we are also very particular about youth involvement as well in agriculture. Most of the people that farm right now, um, they are really old people. And 
The truth is, like he said, you know, we can't survive without food. We can't survive without makeup, air, and all of that, but you can't live without food. And if you have been told that in 2050 we are going to double our population, somebody had better be seriously involved in food production. So our own drive as well is to get a lot of young people involved in agriculture, which is why, again, I commend what's been a great team um, they are really doing. Last year, we were honored to partner with them. Um, we went to Ghana, we went to um, Dubai. I think Tomiwa was on that trip as well. We had a fantastic time. Apart from the their hosting skill, um, we were able to connect with people from different parts of different countries there. So you have people from India, you have people from Kenya, you have people from Ghana. We had, we met with, I remember we met a fish farmer there that we are even planning to partner with in our com uh, company soon that does catfish and he's from Nigeria. I think his farm is in Ilori and he does catfish on a large scale. Um, currently in our, in our company as well, we started a ginger production farm because of this relationship last year because we met um, someone in the UAE that is willing to buy ginger from us. So we are currently producing ginger right now. We are farming ginger right now, and the plan is to export it. So there are a lot of opportunities that we got from that partnership, and it also introduced us to... Um, there is a conference uh, um, one of our uh, companies attending, FarmGate. They were nominated to be part of this event based on this partnership and introduction as well um, that we enjoyed from partnering with them at the event last year. Um, I want to really encourage everyone in this room, um, don't let the story end here with you. Um, let's share the word. They are doing an excellent job. Um, if you have a farmer, if you have a product, you know, the beautiful thing about it is that they are not just coming here to tell us. They will hold your hand to get it done. They will show you how to get your licenses, your registration, they will show you who to meet with the government. The networking is out of this world. And it's an honor and it's a privilege again for us at Farm Crowdy to work with this team and um, see them do many exploits. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Top Right. right. Um, last year, in the second edition, we launched um, Innovate Agri Challenge. Essentially, what we thought to do was to um, promote youth involvement in agriculture while also driving um, the use of technology innovation in agriculture. Right, so what we then did was to have um, people from different parts of Africa apply to be part of the um, pitch competition. And then we had um, se semi-final events happening in four different African countries, in Ghana, in Accra, Ghana. In, 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 from, from Ghana, we have the final, we had the finalist uh, quality trace from Ghana. We had from, from Rwanda, uh, Kigali, Rwanda, we had um, AgriQ, and then from um, Kenya, we also had the finalists, and of course from Nigeria, like we saw in the video, we had um, Smart Farms, who promised us that she was going to go to um, Dubai. Essentially, um, Wind Farmers Conference is a global event, but it was good to have a Nigerian win the first edition. Um, so Smart Farms from Nigeria, beautiful, innovative solution um, for agriculture. Uh, won the inaugural um, um, Innovate Agri Challenge prize, and then um, she went back with um, $5,000 and a lot of other um, opportunities. She's here with us, um, Modupo Oyetosha. She's the founder and um, CEO of Smart Farms. So she will tell us about her experience last year and um, how we can even leverage on more this year. Please put your hands together for Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I want to say a big thank you again um, to Greenovate and um, MTFC. So um, I saw the news that um, Nigeria imports a lot of food. And but when you talk about agriculture, almost everybody wants to run away from agriculture. And so when I started farming, I realized that I, I lost some crops. I had a poor yield. And then I realized that the problem is not because agriculture is not good. The problem is that we don't have the right to to make agriculture work for us. And that's why the yield is so poor and a lot of people are running away from it. And the farmers are also poor. So with the right technology, <coughs> excuse me, with the right technology, that means we can do a better job. We can not just uh, we can feed ourselves, we can also feed the world. 
like we are seeing now that Dubai has a big market, not just Dubai, but a lot of other places also where there is market for our produce. And this is what um, informed my decision to start Smart Farm Nigeria. And um, what we basically do is that we create a platform where farmers will be able to get access to technology to be able to maximize their productivity and improve profitability. And um, it started last year, and um, we are, right now we are we also provide a, um, I call it a co-working space for farming, targeting youth, because I know what I went through when I started farming. So we created a platform where youth can come in, they get access to land, they get access to the right way of farming, they get access to the technology, and then through our platform we are able to raise funds for them to also be able to get access to fund, capital to farm, and then they get the, um, should I say the training they need to do the farm in the right way. So after two years, they are able, enabled, empowered, to go and start an agri-business, because I tell people agriculture is a business. So they are empowered to go and start an agricultural business on their own, um, outside um, what we do. So we also work with smallholder farmers. Right now we are working with over 1,500 smallholder farmers. And a lot of these farmers have not even used tractors to plant or to you know, spray or anything before. So something as simple as mechanization is very difficult for a lot of farmers to get access to. So we are able to enable farmers to get access to all this technology. Um, a lot of farmers lose their crop. You know, in the early days you can predict, oh, the rain is going to start in March and then you can start your farming and everything. But these days with the climate change, we can't predict the weather again. But something as simple as weather data helps farmers to know when to plant and guide their um, guide their operations. So we have to make access to this technology for farmers so that they can improve their program production. And thanks to Greenovate last year, um, with the fund we won, we were able to expand our operation. And like I said, we are now operating on 2,500 acres that we're able to make available for farmers, especially the young people, so that they can be able to have a very good startup, so that they won't run away from agriculture. And, um, and culture is a very big um, business, like I said. It's a very big value chain, and we need different players. So we are working on production, but definitely there's also the market. And it's very, very important for farmers to get access to market. So thanks to Crenovate that is creating the market for us, so that we can focus on the production. And as a value chain, within the value chain, they are creating the market. And going to Dubai, I was so, so surprised last year when I was in Dubai that really there's so much demand. It's so big market there, and the funniest thing is that farmers here will be talking about, oh, there's no market for my produce. But the problem is not that there's no market, but you don't know where the market is. And the market also don't know where the farmers is. And so thanks to Prenovate for creating that platform where farmers, the real farmers now, and the buyers can meet, and then they'll be able to synergize, and we met a lot of people. But for us, apart from markets, something we also met, because a lot of technology providers also came around, we were able to meet people who are able to give us technology, um, um, some technology that we are able to bring down to Nigeria also and improve our productivity. So, um, Crenovate has really helped us to expand our production, expand our uh, technology use in, here in Nigeria also, and um, also expand our network. So, thank you so much for the opportunity and I employ, employ, employ every one of us also as much as possible to be there, especially if you are serious about agriculture and agricultural business. Like I say, agriculture is a business. So if you are serious about agricultural business, um, maybe the former conference is a place where you need to be so that you are able to expand, not just within Nigeria, but outside Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm from NYSET um, Limited, Prince Ajibola. Uluyedi is going to be telling us about um, what essentially what they do at NYSET and the point of synergy with um, Mindy Farmers Conference. Please put your hands together for me. Good morning, still, everyone. Um, my name is Ajibola Uluyedi. I'm the chairman of NYSET Limited. NYSET Limited is a product of research into the Nigerian agri sector and um, its problems. And um, the company was established to address what was considered to be one of the most pivotal barriers 
to participation by Nigerian producers, agricultural producers, in the international market. And that is the issue of conformity, assessment, and certification. You know, as um, rightly pointed out, one of the, in fact, the main challenge that was raised by uh, one of the earlier speakers, one of the uh, innovative uh, people, is the issue of standards and certification. Now, what many people may not know is that it's not just that Nigerian farmers uh, are unaware of where the market for their products are. It's that they are unable to access those markets, you know. And um, if you look at, we, we did a bit of study on, on some of our products where Nigeria has um, some level comparative advantage over other countries in the world. And one of them was already mentioned, cassava, and uh, today. But there are others, like cashew. Cashew, for example, Nigeria is the largest producer of cashew in the world. We produce about 50.6% of world cashew. And we are not even registered in the international market as a producer. Instead, guess who is the largest producer? There is a $3 billion market for Nigerian cashew in Europe and America. And guess who supplies that market? Vietnam. Vietnam buys 99% of Nigerian cashew, and they've created an industry in Vietnam processing Nigerian cashew for export to America and Europe. And our farmers who produce the cashew in Nigeria, of course, are living in poverty. Now, the reason is not because they don't know that Americans eat cashew or Europeans eat cashew. It's because they don't know how to produce in a manner that meets the standards of those markets. And it's the same with uh, the GCC region. You will find that in tandem with the progress around the developed world, the GCC region also is putting in place strict food standards. Like uh, in the average, for example, they have the federal law number 10, which they uh, enacted in uh, 2015. And this new law, federal law number 10, in the Emirates sets up very strict standards for food imports into the Emirates uh, region, as you know, uh, comprising a few countries there. And most of our producers in Nigeria are not even aware of these standards, let alone to know how to, you know, conform with it through their production. Because, you know, meeting the standards involves traceability and other factors. You know, and that's the reason why many of the countries that set up these standards accredit third-party agencies to help them to do what we call conformity assessment, to be sure that those who want to export goods to their countries meet or conform with those standards. And the demonstration of that conformity is in the certificates that are issued by those third-party agencies like us. And that is the reason why we brought, um, we established NISAT to bridge that gap. First of all, the knowledge gap to help Nigerian farmers to recognize what standards are applicable to the products that they are producing. And you know, there are different standards. For example, we certify for 96 different standards. And there are different standards for crops, and there are different standards for markets. For example, you will find in the UAE that Perhaps the major standards are halal, for example, and some other standards that are not necessarily the same as European standards. And you know, now the uh, Federal uh, Ministry of Climate Change and Environment of the Emirates has started an organic, um, uh, an organic scheme too. So and. Guess what? Where we even have advantages in Africa is in relation to our capacity to produce organic products. We, st we still have a lot of capacity. We still have a lot of land that has not been submitted to use by farmers yet. And these are even uh, lands that could be organic in the world that will fetch us very high premium, far above 
conventional products that we were aspiring to produce. You know, so essentially, you know, uh, NYSAT is set up to help to train, educate farmers in their production systems to be able to conform with relevant standards that are applicable to their products so that they can access the lucrative market. So we'll, we'll stop being victims of uh, traffickers, if you like. You know, because you can imagine that how much does Nigeria make from cashew in comparison to what Vietnam makes for the cashew that it exports to the lucrative markets. And it's the same thing with ginger too. With ginger, we are number two in the world after India. But China is the largest exporter of ginger in the whole world. And that's because China buys most of the ginger Nigeria produces. So they process it for the world. So Nigeria is not earning anything. And the reason is simply because we are not producing in conformity with the standards of the markets that the Chinese and the Vietnam, Vietnamese, and even the Ghanaians, for example, now are able to access. So we're not getting the kind of compensation that we deserve for all the work that we're doing in producing. this, And that's the reason why Notwithstanding the figures that were given earlier, the International Labour Organization said to us that whereas in 2002, Nigeria, 50, over 50% of Nigerians were engaged in some profitable activity in agriculture in Nigeria, profitable, not subsistence, to, by 2015 it had fallen to 22%. So only 22% of Nigerians in 2015 were engaged in any profitable activity in agriculture in Nigeria. It's raising a marginally since 2015 till now. It's raising by you know maybe two percent, you know, but it can be much better than that. And the reason why it fell is because Nigerian products were being banned or being rejected across the world because they were not in conformity with the standards of those markets. You know, and that you know what that means. If you if you spend all your money producing some goods, you export it to Dubai, and it gets to Dubai and is rejected at the ports. And we're talking about millions of naira. That could cost your business to go into insolvency and fold up. So that means you lose your investments, your staff lose their jobs. So employment falls and unemployment rises, and that is the reason why we had that fall from 50%. 22% in 2015. So this conformity assessment and certification is therefore very important for us to be able to, you know, uh, get maximal benefits for our activities in the agri sector in Nigeria. And that's where we come in. And we're very happy with what um, Crenovate has been able to do in the last uh, three to four years in terms of creating awareness for Nigerian goods in the GCC region. But I'm sure there will be now, and I'm sure that's the reason why you know, we are partnering with them, to ensure that their vision for giving access to Nigerian producers in that region comes to fruition. Because notwithstanding whatever money you may get from the banks, notwithstanding how many tons of product you may produce, if those products do not meet with those standards, especially in this new standard I just talked about, the federal law number 10 of 2015, you will, just, you will have wasted your resources because it might be rejected. Like many Nigerian products are constantly being rejected at various ports across the world. Even as we're talking here now, some product, Nigerian product somewhere, is being rejected and or banned for non-conformity with those standards. You know, and I'm sure many of you remember the beans uh, issue and the yam escapade. All these are all, all boiled down to that issue. And uh, one of the things that were listed on the list of things you needed for exports was a phytosanitary certificate. NYSA can also help you with that because we have partnered with the major uh, standard organizations in Nigeria, NAQS, uh, uh, NAFDAQ, etc. 
to ensure that you know, even they too are able to do the kind of things that the uh, Emirates authorities are doing for their country in terms of protecting their country against uh, bad products, products that are capable of killing their people, products that are not good for their health, products that do not meet with ethical standards like trafficking and environmental protection and so on. These are the things that are comprised in many of those standards that you need to comply with. And NYSAT will help you. NYSAT will you know, conduct the training you require. And NYSAT will help you also with market linkage. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, sir. Um, we, what, that was quite enlightening. Thank you for uh, the enlightenment. I mean, farmers and agribusinesses in the house, I'm sure, have taken one or two things away from that. Right? Um, so we move on to um, welcoming, uh, apparently, one of the um, largest agribusiness groups in Nigeria, uh, Dizengov. Uh, they are here with us today, country manager Dizengov, Graham Leslie. He will be, um, be telling us about, um, in, 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 in a few details, what they do at the Zengov and the point of um, synergy with um, the Farmers Conference. Um, Sir Graham, you have the stage. Please put your hands together. Yes, good morning all once again uh, to those that I haven't said good morning to. Uh, it's a privilege for me to be here to represent the Zengov. Uh, and I'd like to just really congratulate Prenovate on what they've achieved in the last few years. Um, it's, it's an amazing story, and I think it's a story that's going to really grow in the future. And if we can connect farmers with buyers and su suppliers, I think we've got a whole value chain that, that uh, in, in sort of gives the, the country capacity in what we really need to be doing. So what, does, uh, what is Dizengoff all about? dizengoff has been invested in Nigeria for 60 years. So it's not a new company, it's been here, it's a, it's a fairly common brand. We're in two sort of silos of business, agribusiness and communications. The agribusiness side is obviously our strength, we've been in it for many years. We supply machinery, uh, equipment, we supply of greenhouses, uh, agricultural inputs and such products. But to be honest, if our customers were able to export that would really be a feather in our cap. That would mean that the investment we've made over the years in producing good quality agricultural crop crops um, that are able to be traceable and sent to other markets would be, would be a real feather in the cap for us. So going forward, we hope to do this. And I think through Crenovate, we can actually link our buyers with these uh, uh, sellers in different countries. So it's back to strengthening, strengthening the basics. And that was one of what our earlier speakers said. If we can strengthen the basics by providing technologies, uh, equipment, machinery that can be used to till lands to produce quality crops in, in good volumes, in other words, improve our yields, then we can go to the next level in Nigeria. Obviously, there are areas that uh, create difficulties, and they're all to do with infrastructure, um, we need sort of roads, we need storage, we need processing facilities. Those will come for, with time. If we know where our markets are and we know where our farmers are and we can be the chain in the middle that helps the farmers produce crops, then I think there's a, there's a future for all of us. And what's quite interesting is that every tractor and implement that we sell in the market creates six farming jobs. And those six farming jobs obviously create food, which can be produced, processed, which creates a whole online chain of people and employment. So that would be very important in the, in the future of us. We are also suppliers of agricultural uh, irrigation equipment. And I think what's very important is when you have an off-taker of a product, they want to see that product throughout the year. So we can rely on the rainy season to produce a product, but what about the off-season? We have perfect weather in the off-season here to be able to produce a crop. But with limitations, such as water, you have a problem. If you take our, our irrigation equipment, and sort of micro-sprinkler systems and family packs that we actually make for farmers, you can actually create, create these crops in the off-season and help your supplier, and really, at the end of the day, help Nigeria with the whole uh, infrastructure process. 
uh, creating more self-sufficiency, less dependency on imports, uh, and all the good things that go with it. Um, I guess what we'd like to see is some of the barriers being broken down and what, what uh, some of our earlier speakers have been saying about duty-free zones and much more efficient imports of products and stuff. That would really help us and that would help our customers and if our customers are helped in that respect with cheaper duties, etc., etc., with uh, products that are imported for their needs, uh, that would help substantially. For instance, I'll give you an example. We import a soluble fertilizer product that's not made in this country. It's been sitting in a port overseas for 18 months and can't get in because it's been blocked. So if we have duty-free zones and an understanding of products that the country needs to produce agricultural products to give us the yields and the quality, we'll be moving a long way. And I think that's one of our challenges and I think that's a challenge of, of many of us sitting around here. So just really, once again, to Crenovate, well done on putting this together. Good luck for the future. We are very, very privileged to be a partner of yours, and we look forward to the next conference. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Graham. Uh, thank you to um, Dizengo for the support we have received thus far. All right, um, so this year we've had um, seven new um, partners come on board. Um, interesting businesses, I must say. Um, from what they are currently doing with um, agriculture, some of them digital agriculture, in different um, aspects of um, the value chain, it's been interesting to have some new partners come on board to um, help us, of course, spread the word around agro-exports, and also in turn, um, receive value, commensurate value for their businesses. We have with us um, um, Farm Connect, we have Farm Center, we have Farm Funded, we just um, send them on as partners. So um, from Farm Center this morning, we have um, Daniel Adika. They're going to tell us um, basically in, in the short details what, what um, their business is about and um, the major points of collaboration with um, Made the Farmers Conference. Please put your hands together for representatives from Farm Center. Good morning, everyone. Uh, our protocol TV of ZAP. My name is Daniel Adika. I'm the CFO, the Chief Technology Officer of Farm Center. Uh, what is Farm Center? Farm Center is um, basically addressing the major challenges of rural farmers in Nigeria. Uh, now, how do we do that? We provide them with uh, basic farm input and um, First of all, I would uh, like to appreciate Cranovate for giving us this opportunity to partner with them, especially creating a, a new market for rural farmers in Nigeria. And um, we, we believe that this is going to be a very good one for us at Farm Center and a plus for us. Uh, Farm Center has worked with uh, rural farmers in various regions in Nigeria, and currently we we have um, a maize farm going on in Ogun State, which is currently empowering about over 35 rural farmers. And um, we give them basic farm inputs. We provide them um, some of the technological support. Uh, we understand that one of the challenges of farmers is um, having to practice precise farming. And um, how do we do that? We give them um, accurate weather forecast. We have partners that we're working with that give them this accurate weather forecast so that they can uh, predict uh, the weather as to when to apply basic farm um, fertilizers and all of you on the farmland. And, uh, and also, we, we are also giving these farmers access to premium markets. Uh, you agree with me that um, it is not enough to just produce or to cultivate this produce. We need a market for these farmers to sell their produce. So we're not just empowering them with basic farm input, but we are also giving them access to premium market. And uh, with our new partnership with Crenovate, we believe that um, it will go a long way to give them more access to the premium market. Uh, I can imagine if a farmer has the opportunity to sell tons of uh, a cassava farm uh, into international markets, it will not just only 
add to the GDP of the Nigerian economy, but it also empower the rural farmer as well. Uh, the farmers produce a lot, but um, looking at their livelihood, it's, uh, it's something that uh, gives a number of us worries. And the Farm Center is one of these companies that is um, addressing these basic needs of the rural farmers, giving them input, and not just that, it will give them training as well. Uh, because we know that uh, a lot of them, they need some trainings to be able to use some of these tools that will be provided for them. So we train them, we give them access to funds. Uh, if a farmer does not have food in the stomach, uh, I wonder how we're able to farm very well. So we provide them access to funds and, and make it possible for them to carry out their sorry, farm process uh, successfully without any stress. So Farm Center, like uh, I uh, rightly said, it's uh, added value to the agricultural uh, chain process uh, in the area of uh, uh, farming and um, also processing. Uh, we're looking at going to processing, cassava processing, rice, and all of the uh, farm produce. And I would believe that our partnership with uh, Curovate will give us a lot of opportunity to do all of these things and um, add to the uh, GDP of the Nigerian economy. So thank you once more, Trinovay, and um, we hope to see you in Dubai. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Farm, um, farm Center. Um, from interesting, interesting solutions, interesting solutions. From Farm Funded, we have um, CEO Farm Funded Joshua Ajisopwe is also with us, um, and he'll be telling us about Farm Funded and um, what what possible points uh, of convergence we made the farmers conference that we have. Yeah, thank you. Please come, come around, sir. Please put your hands together for Joshua Ajisopwe. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I want to say thank you to the Greenovit uh, organization for this opportunity. Uh, so for us at Farm Funded, we are driven with the goal to achieve food security, and that's our main vision, ensuring that Africans, Nigerians can have access to food. Food has been available, accessible, utilized, and it's been sufficient. Uh, I want to say that when we were, myself and my colleagues at, at the office, we've been thinking of how we can be to explore international markets. Uh, we've been looking at how we can begin to go out there to sell most of the commodities that we have at our disposal, that is, from the farmers that we work with. And so when we, got, when we heard about the Meet the Farmers Conference, we definitely knew that this is another opportunity for us to be at Dubai, because before now we've been looking at better opportunities, how we will not fall into the hands of uh, people who would not do business well with us. I want to say a very big thank you to Crenovate for this opportunity and because we know that they will definitely give us the platform for a sustainable business relationship. With the, with the platform that Crenovate is providing to us, we will definitely look at how Farm Funded as an organization, Farmstar also as an organization, will be partnering with, with Crenovate to ensure that there is a sustainable business relationship. Thank you very much. Right, so uh, members of the press, pretty much everybody, agribusiness, uh, anybody from the value chain, whatever questions is on our minds, we can ask them now and we'll get um, useful answers to them at this time. So do we have questions, please? I want to find out, we've been doing this business since 2016. How much, I want to look at the volume of business now. How, how much volume are you handling? That you put these things in terms of figures between Nigeria and uh, Dubai? Uh, thank you very much for that question. Um, first of all, let me um, also let you understand that what we've been doing for the past two, three years is also creating awareness for this market. So as we've been going around Africa, a lot of people are not even clients and all of that. But we've been quite successful with Ghana, with um, Kenya and then with Rwanda. We've not done a lot um, what's called in Nigeria. There's been actually a lot of demand and order. 
from a lot of the experts and the farmer about complying and then standards are the things that we are still addressing at the moment. I'm Mrs. Esther Adebayo. I'm the MD CEO of GMS Schools Agro Business Ventures. I'm an exporter and I'm a food processor. I've observed that in Nigeria, even for our government, I'm a retired and now that I'm out of the system, uh, I was able to tell them this. I make our uh, government, our system, what we are missing. Like, we are talking of farmers. The rural farmers in Nigeria are left on their own. And we cannot, uh, we cannot experience any any uh, improvements in our exports if the farmers are not taken care of. The application of uh, pesticides or whatever they want to do when they are farming, the type of seeds they are growing, and uh, coupled with what is going on in international markets now, people are looking for organic foods. They want organic food. If you are an exporter, you have not um, seen how farmers are producing, you can't export anything that will not be rejected. And that is why our products are being rejected. And uh, I just pray that uh, one day somebody will be at the end of affairs of uh, agriculture, I mean, at the national level, and they will be able to listen and even see the plight of the farmers. And all these ones that we are talking, we can't, without taking these people along, without uh, taking care of them, without seeing all their challenges, uh, we'll just be uh, having meetings upon meetings, and that is Nigeria for you. But uh, at this time, we have to uh, look at that. Say something, um, to have something to that. That was a very good observation. And for us as well, that's one of the reasons we actually initiated this platform. You can see from the numbers, we can say GCC, 100 million. You can see we are not saying Europe, we are not saying America. We are looking at a country that is easy for us to penetrate. This is a country that is a desert. And then we, we have the resources. The synergy is like perfect. It's like a match made in heaven. But the thing is, even for the rural farmers, for the local farmers, for the small older farmer, that's why we've been screaming that we can't do this by ourselves. We need as much collaboration as possible. We are not an agri firm, we're a consulting firm. And our target, also to um, buttress on the question in asked, our target is actually 1% of this 100 billion for Cranovit as, uh, as a company. If we keep doing these conferences, we are going to run at a huge loss. If actual trade are not happening, and for this trade to happen, we need the small older farmers, we need the rural farmers, we need everyone as much as we can. And think about it, we are going to all, almost all African countries, going to even the GCC countries. Because basically for us, even before the conference, we try to, that's one of the reasons we have our offices in Nigeria, in Ghana, in Kenya, in Rwanda. But by this weekend, I'll be in Ivory Coast as well for the same thing. So we need to get people prepared for how can they really export to the UAE. If this trade doesn't happen, Cranovit have been wasting their time. And to be honest with you, our target is 1% of this 100 billion, which is a billion. And I know it's very doable if we have everybody coming together. So it's not just something for only Cranovit to do, or, or just you to do, or all the stakeholders. Yes, we need to come together one way of actually um, putting things together and saying we want this to work. We can't keep complaining or saying the government the private sector, we need to do something about it. So I believe this is also a step, and I know a lot of organizations are doing the same thing. But for us, our, for this conference, is tied to our target as a company. We need to trade. We are not a conference company, and we are not an agribusiness company. We are facilitating the trade. So I think for us, that's one of the difference. As well, without trade, we don't make profits. We don't make money. When you say we are going to be farmer, and we appreciate your efforts at facilitating trade, export, and all of that. And of course, also with regards to bringing young people into the farming population. And one of the challenges we always had as farmers is that um, if you 
Cultivate the crops, have a crop farmer, you cultivate the crops and you decide to sell off your crops in its raw form. Wow. You are actually shortening yourself. I know that's why there's a very strong application for them processing. Now, one of the things we've always been having is the issue of NAFDAC. Getting NAFDAC registration and all that for our processes. Whatever you are processing. I don't think there's any way you are either doing it now when we intend collaborating with NAFTA to make these things easier for us. I know of recent the these um, serious increments in their fees and all that, and of course it's scaring more of us. What do we do? A lot of us are already doing it as is processing things in the um, um, gradually, but we haven't gotten some, and we haven't gotten, gotten the right certification yet. What do we need to do? Because we all want to tap into this um, market that you're talking about, both local and international. Of course, getting certification both local and international is very key. So I don't know if you have any plans to support or facilitate us in that regard. I was going to say, I think he's in the best position to address that. Now, the first thing that you need to understand is that you do not need enough data for the GCC region. They're not really looking for enough data certification for to give, to give access to your products in their market. They're looking for certification of conformity with their own standards. So your NAFDAQ certification is really for Nigerian consumption, for the Nigerian market. You know, and you know, NISA is not even accredited, I'm sorry, uh, NAFDAQ. NAFDAQ is not accredited to uh, carry out conformity assessment for the uh, standards that even Nigeria, we have, expect Nigeria to eventually adopt for its own market, you understand? You know, because NAFTA has a specialized role to play. You know, there's also RISOE. There is all these are dealing with local, uh, the local market in Nigeria. And currently, there is a new quality infrastructure being set up. And NISAT is a part of that committee that is setting up the quality infrastructure for Nigeria. SON is part of it, NAFTA is part of it. We are part of it. The um, quarantine service is also part of it. I mentioned that when I was talking earlier. So that well, the, the idea of that is to try and centralize it and make it easier for local producers and also for importers eventually. So they don't have to jump through several hoops before you can come into the market. All the markets, even in the GCC region now, they're, they're unifying their standards so that it's easier. So if you're in conformity with one standard, you can export to any of the countries within that region. So you don't need, uh, if you're comfortable with, the, with, for instance, talking about Dubai being a hub, uh, a trading hub, if you're in conformity with the food uh, standards for Dubai, you may not be in conformity with the food standards for Saudi Arabia currently. But with the unification going on, you will find that once you're in conformity with the standards in Dubai, then you're in conformity with the other countries. So that helps you now to take the benefit from the free trade zones that are available in Dubai and so on and so forth. So, but when you get back to your question about helping with uh, NAFDAQ, we, we've talked to NAFDAQ a lot. If you get in touch with us in our office, we can help you also to find out what the bottlenecks are for your own uh, processing facility and to assist you in whatever way we can. Time is a question that at this time I want to ask this question. Like my company, I'll be able to uh, got I'll be I'll be able to get the the USDA and FDA certificate for my product. But in the course I went to in Chicago to, uh, 2018, they still want me to get that of my country, and uh, that we need certification that uh, what I'm bringing, if I say it's organic, there should be a certificate that it, uh, that to prove it. So that as I've got that one there, I should be able to get that of my, uh, of my contract. I've been going around uh, since all this time, now that I uh, our man uh, talk, I'll be able to see that we really need that and uh, maybe we may be able to elaborate more the steps that exporters especially and the food processors are to take because if we don't export add, adding value 
we be better for us than to export our products raw and uh, we need that certification and the proof. Okay. But really, if that's part of what we've been doing, we've been around for almost two years now, one and a half years. And we've spent hundreds of millions of naira on various awareness programs for farmers because they just don't know the difference. We have met at a conference a gentleman who told us that he doesn't need anything beyond NAFTA certification to export his goods to the US. You know, and people don't understand that if you claim that you are producing an organic product, for example, it must be certified organic. It's not you to tell us that it's organic. It has to be submitted for conformity assessment with organic standards. And there are various organic standards around the world. America has its NOP, which is implemented by USDA, as she said. Uh, Europe has its own EU regulations. Japan has the JAS. There are many other organic programs going on. I just told you now that even the uh, Emirates Ministry of Climate Change and Environment has started its own organic program now. So if you say you are producing organic, an organic product you want to send it to Dubai market or any other market in that region, you need a certificate. Now, this certificate requires traceability. And that's why I'm surprised somebody tells me I have USDA certificate in America. When you don't Nobody you have not submitted the goods to conformity assessment in Nigeria because you will not get a certificate in America that your product is organic until it has, they have traced it to the roots. They, they, they will trace it even to the soil, to the inputs. The fertilizer you use, the pesticide you use, if it does not meet with organic standards, and there are a list of uh, pesticides and uh, fertilizers that are recognized as organic pesticides and fertilizers that you can use for organic production. If you don't do that, you can't get your certificate at the port of entry. You get your certificate after it's been the entire chain has been inspected and audited by a third party conformity assessment agency such as NISAT and ECOSAT. You know, they will go through, they'll come to your farm, they look at your organic system program and make sure that your record keeping is in order, you have proper toilets where they should be. There are many things involved. You are not employing under eight children. You know, there are many things involved in meeting those standards. They're not difficult once you know it. But if you don't know it, of course you're going to keep failing. So, Madam, it's important for you to contact NISAT, because I believe NISAT is probably the only company in Nigeria today that is in, interested in training Nigerians to conform. There are many conformity assessment uh, agencies in Nigeria, but you find out that they are more interested in certification work. They just want to get your work to certify, and of course, it's like nobody wants to go and do jam, and you didn't do tutorial, you are likely to fail, but they will have collected your money before they give you your certificate of failure. But NISAT, NISAT will train you and teach you like a tutorial teacher, and ensure that you are ready for the exam, before you now submit yourself for the exam, and then when you, of course, you are more likely to pass, you know, because the same people that are training you were trained by the same people that are coming to certify you. You understand? So it's easy. Even though they are independent, they are independent groups because of conflict of interest reasons. They cannot be, the same person cannot train you and certify you. So that's what you need, madam. You need us to come in and help you to set up your plan. After you have 500 farmers Okay. You, you come and then we'll talk about it. Okay. And then we'll see where 
how you structured your organic program. So if your organic program, because you know, even Nigeria has an association of organic producers, and they are operating by iPhone standards. You know, iPhone. You know, the iPhone standard is not necessarily American standard. So we need to look at what you are doing, because you may be operating in accordance with iPhone standard, and you may yet not get certification for NOP, which is American standard. So when we, when you, after this program, if you contact us, so we can say that organizers, then we can look through the, the details of what you're doing and see if you're really, you know, doing organic farming or not. Thank you very much. My name is Antonio Awon, and I write for Leadership Newspaper. I will still direct my question to Prince Ajibola. What I want to know is that if, uh, if, NICET gives uh, uh, exportation assistance to Nigerians. Do you also give, you know, foreigners who want to bring in goods into the country, do you give them such services? That is one. Then the second question is that, what is the level of compliance of uh, Nigerian exporters compared to other countries who import into the country? Let's see, follow up to that, sorry. I, my my concern is that there are so many certifications, both whether in Goku and all that, and I and it's a problem, and it's also very expensive. How do we address this thing? Because you are talking about, I know you are coming to the field, and I know that a lot of people export Goku, and they use different certification aside you. I mean, how do we harmonize this thing? Because it's not one thing to say certification, you have almost like four or five of them, and are very expensive, and this thing runs on course. Because you are sending these things are cost and you are talking about certification, these are extra costs for the common farmers. Who bears it? Is it the consumer or the exporter himself? Thank you for those uh, questions. They're very good questions, actually. Let me start with yours. And your question really is, uh, is one question we keep answering all the time. The, it doesn't matter how many certification companies there are. The, particular standard that is applicable to your product depends on what that product is and the market that you're taking it to. Now the problem we find with many Nigerians is that it's a gamble. They just you know find looking for a market somewhere to put take the goods to. You know and often what they're doing is to get SON certification and that certification NAQS, which is the quarantine service certification. So all these are hoops that exporters have to jump through. Like I said, we're working on that right now to ensure that it is unified into one standard so that exporters, Nigerian exporters, don't have to jump through several hoops or producers in, in that sense before they can uh, export. Because ordinarily, those, those certifications from only NAQS is relevant to export because of the Phytosanitary certificates that they issue for your product to show that it is not afflicted with various uh, infestations. You understand? NAFTAC is not relevant to the market. Uh, uh, SON is not relevant to an export market. For cocoa, you will find out that for cocoa, maybe is um, uh, uh, the, the what is applicable to cocoa is um, a different kind of standard. It's not it's a market standard. It's, it's not even a legal standard. It's a, it's a what you would call a conventional standard set up by those who import cocoa, and you have to meet that. And you know we we certify for the, all those standards, global gap, uh, and various other standards. I don't. I'm trying to remember some of them even right now. As I'm talking to you. So for cocoa, I know that there's the uh, acid acid uh, certification that is currently being required. Which is the hazard, uh, you know, and so on, control point certification. That is a major certification you need for every market in the world. But for cocoa also, there is a particular uh, standard, you know, a commercial standard that applies to cocoa. It's just that one standard, you know. And once you have a one certification agency working on your on your project for you, you meet all those standards automatically. If, for instance, you are, you are meeting organic standards, organic standards do not require all those other inferior standards because organic standards are the highest standards. Once you have conformed with an organic standard, automatically you have conformed with all the others. 
Because, for example, if you are talking about global gap, and the global gap is prescribing for you uh, the percentage of pesticide residue that should be in your product. But if you are producing organic, there is no pesticide residue at all allowed. Zero pesticide residue. So once you meet with that one standard, you don't need to go again and say, I want to get certified for uh, global gap or some other inferior standard. So essentially, you need to get in touch with an accredited agency that can help you to develop your own, if you like, business plan for export. So you will know exactly what standard you need to be. So you will just be guessing and going around spending money trying to get certified for uh, a variety of standards. I hope I have addressed uh, your question uh, to, to a certain extent. Now, um, my brother was saying something about. Sorry, if you, if you give those okay. If, no, you see, Nigeria doesn't have currently, apart from uh, NAFTA and SOA, Nigeria does not have its own legal standard. We don't have an organic uh, scheme, Nigeria, for example, whereby we will have our own standard. So, apparently, if you go to the shelves of the supermarkets, you're going to see organic products that are USDA certified. So, but Nigeria has confidence in the USDA certification. You know, we don't have reciprocity from you. US. US doesn't have any confidence in any product that claims to be organic from Nigeria, even if anybody says so. Other than if it is certified by one of their accredited third-party agencies like us, because we are accredited to certify for NOB. You know, so if you have a certificate, you get into the American organic uh, market. Now, that is for exports from Nigeria. For imports into Nigeria, there, there's no requirement for any standard. That's why you know the farmers in Nigeria are facing a hard time because they are competing with a few quality goods. And you know, somebody asked me now, I said, I said, how do you encourage Nigerians to produce high quality goods? You've got to close the door to importation of inferior quality goods so that they can get the proper prices for their goods because it's expensive to produce quality goods. You understand that like you're saying? And you know, when you produce quality goods, you actually want something that demonstrates. Like when you say, I, have, I went to the university, you can tell people's stories about what happened at the university, but if you don't have a certificate, I don't think anyone will employ you, isn't it? So it's the same thing with quality goods. You need a certificate that demonstrates that you have actually conformed with the quality standards. You know, and that is what is lacking currently in our country with regard to what we import. And that's where there are all sorts of charlatans in the market. Even Pomo, there is artificial Pomo in the Nigerian market. And it's driving out the uh, people, the butchers, and uh, those who are cattle rearing and so on. They're driving them out of the, out of the market. And because you, have, you can buy artificial Pomo made from old bags from the rubbish dump and shoes in the market today. You know, and there are various other things that are going on that are very shameful because we're not operating our own quality infrastructure. But as I said, that will soon be history because Nigeria is currently working on And I believe very soon we're going to publish our own quality infrastructure, even if only for conventional goods. Let's leave, let's leave organic. Let's talk about conventional products. And then, of course, maybe we will be accredited to uh, certify for some people who are coming in from outside Nigeria and bringing their products to Nigeria. Okay, um, I'm David Ibidapo from Business Day. So now, with all these challenges that we've all um, highlighted and everything, so this leads to my own question of, is Nigeria actually positioned as a better position for the African Trade Agreement? He said this time. Because uh, when you look at um, the infrastructural issues, even the um, appetite of Nigerians on imported goods and other cost-related um, issues. So do we think Nigeria is really positioned um, to, to unlock the benefits that they um, subscribe to this African trade uh, agreement? Thank you. I believe this question is open to everyone, not just for the way. Anybody want to take? I think we are ready. It, our government may not be ready. But I, I could see I could, I could see some private people. I, I will be number one that will be ready to meet up and 
go there and let them know that Nigerians can do better than what they are looking at. But if we are waiting for the government, then we are not ready. But I'm, I can assure you that there are individuals, private companies, and even the farmers, you need to see them. When they see you, when I was going around the farms and I was talking to them, they are ready. Uh, it's only that they have not been given the opportunity and the support the, our government is supposed to give to us has not been given. We only see everything on the TV. But when it comes to the reality, you will see that it's no bad. People are ready. And uh, our government will just see that there will be a revolution uh, among the downtrodden, the rural populace, because they are now wiser than the year 2015 or even last year. People are getting more enlightened. They have their children telling them, and they are seeing things that are happening in other countries. So we are ready. But if our government may not be ready, but I'm sure the private people, the individuals are ready. Good morning. Good afternoon, sorry. My name is Andrew Bola. To address something uh, Madam said, I have out of the opinion that uh, this kind of event is actually supposed to be something where we should try to see how we leave government out of it actually. Because in the first place, I actually have to, I'm of this opinion that government has no business doing business. When government comes into business, they just come to spoil it. No offense to them. Uh, she said something about revolution. The Black and Greeks, the farm crowdies, and the rest of them, we are also one of them. I believe it's not even a competition, it's more like an agri revolution. Because if organizations like ourselves are standing up to actually do some of these things that government should be doing, we should just forget about them and try to focus on those things and see how we can actually drive the market, drive the business itself. Because at the end of the day, in the last four years, they said we've, we've increased the import, uh, exportation of rice, we've done this, we've done that, we've done this and all that. And yet, if you still look at the demands that we still have, we still haven't met those demands we even need inside our own country too. So the export market, yes, is very fantastic and we would also like to participate and all that. But there's also the demand here too that we haven't even met. So the government should just, let's just forget about them and just focus on how we would actually drive the whole thing and make it work on our own. Because at the end of the day, when you talk to a young official, when they go, they come back, they will still go back to the oil sector. The agri sector is like a forbidden fruit to them. All the noise they make about it is just always, uh, then at the end of the day, you don't hear anything about it again. So that is where the agri revolution comes to play. We are the ones that, we are the force that will actually drive that revolution and make it work. Because Nigeria should be at the forefront, child of Africa, we should be at the forefront of all these things. But at the end of the day, you find out that when they are listing some things, they'll say we're number two. Like what uh, he said the other time, he said we're number two, we're number one, we're number this. But we're not being acknowledged in those other countries because the American now, the Kashuna, now, they know it's coming from Vietnam. They don't, they don't know it's coming from, they know it's coming from Nigeria, quite alright, but it's Vietnam that is supplying it to them. I served in Nasarawa where I found out that the, the bitumen or something, the, the guys that were coming to mine that bitumen from that place, the government didn't even know they were there. And those guys were taking millions of naira worth of that product out of this country. The government didn't know, the government didn't care. So just a few selected people that were actually uh, ripping off that thing. Those are the areas that we need to focus on and see how we can actually drive it on our own. Let's get the government out of it. Their policies, yes, their policies will impact what we're doing. Let's focus on that policy. Okay, you guys, help us with this policy, but leave the business for us. Because once you bring them into the business, they won't even come to kill it. Trust me. Exactly. That's my own opinion. Any question? I actually wanted to ask a question. Yes. Uh, my name is Paul Gaitaba. I work with Compass Global Business Services. I can't wait to progress on what you just said right now. Um, and what Madam said, I believe authoritatively that the private sector is going to move the African trade agreement, not the government. Yeah. It's the private sector in Nigeria is going to move it. Like we did, um, if you look at the beauty industry as well, the revolution keeps going from one, in one sector to another. When you look at the beauty industry as well right now in Nigeria, you see that it's the private sector that is moving it. The government are not doing anything about it. And so as well, the, the agricultural sector. So I believe 
none of that. It is just the private sector that is going to move in, and we are still going to be in the forefront at the trade. We are going to be in the forefront as Nigerians. We might not be recognized, but you still find out that Nigeria is doing more better things over there. Thank you. Hello everyone. My name is Tokmo Chedu, CEO of Compass Global. So um, I wanted to just say that um, it's important to not leave government out. Um, I think that government does have a role. Um, I think that the bottom line of agriculture is about trade, it's about transactions. And if government doesn't do what it's supposed to do to enable business to happen, then we're just all running around and it's not going to amount to much, frankly. Um, so what we need to do is to lobby government to take their appropriate positions. So we talk about the, the trade agreement. It may be aspirational, uh, but I think, yes, Nigeria is positioned. Um, our market size, uh, the uh, size of uh, the produce, the yield that is uh, we can bring, uh, that can come out of our market, makes compels us to be at the conversation table globally where decisions are being made. Uh, the market may have issues, but it doesn't absolve it from t being represented at important decision, uh, trade, global decision-making tables, because the Nigerian farmers and the entire value chain are relying on government to represent it. So your 500 farmers, for example, madam, are not going to amount to much if government doesn't do what it needs to do. And that's really important. So I think, so I think that it's all well and good for us to applaud the progress that private sector is making and uh, to uh, bond together with Crenovate the vision and to try and rally round to ensure that this sector actually reaches its uh, full uh, viability. But by all means, we must compel government to take action. Thank you. Any other question? I just want to briefly support what Madame is trying to, you know, in connection with uh, uh, getting the government involved. Definitely, for the actor actor to work, government must have a very important role to play, directly or indirectly. Especially when it has to do with building strong institutions like the customs, you know. Because the border has to be well uh, fortified for trade between inter-trade uh, activities to go on. Well. That is where it, the government has a very, very critical role to play. Institutions must be very strong before anything can work. Um, I have some questions here from the audience. Somebody asked that a lot of farmers are interested in exportation to Dubai but they don't have enough funds for the export and they are going to fall out. What can we do about such situations? Now, um, basically the Middle Farmers Conference is not just for farmers alone. We are actually calling on everyone within the value chain. Now, when we are talking about farmers, we are not looking for even, because of the Dubai market, we are not looking for just one farm to supply the Dubai region. Even most of the people we are reaching out to when it comes to farmers are like the cooperative farmers. For example, the demand in Dubai is a loss. A lot of people don't get to trade with the Dubai optakers because someone can tell you I need. We had, um, even during the conference last year, there was a farmer, that um, an optaker that wanted um, ginger water of $15 million. And all the farmers that came, the ginger farmers, they can just do 100,000, 250,000 and whatnot. So we are not able to, but it was a Chinese, um, um, what's it called? Exporter that was able to do that. He, and he did it from Kaduna actually. Came to Nigeria. No, this is the truth. We have to say it the way it is. And they were able to aggregate about, I think, 3,000 farmers to be able to do this and whatnot. So another thing for us, let me say Africans, we need to learn how to work together. Because most of the time, we like this only me. I should be the only one doing this. But you can't do $15 million. But if you, if, you, if you go around, let's say, four or five states, and you know, aggregate the farmers together, talk to the cooperatives and whatnot. So basically, the solution to this, the person who asked this question is, let's come together and work together. We need to stop this only me. It's better I make uh, 100,000 US dollars with other people than trying to make $5,000 alone. 
and whatnot. So I think that's the way forward when it comes to, um, because of course, one farmer does not have the money to go set up in Dubai to pay for the exportation and whatnot. But if we come to, even we tell people, we even tell some of our clients who are investors, who are not even in the agribusiness, especially our oil and gas clients, you don't even have to be a farmer. But you have the funds to be able to, you know, set up, you know, um, what's it called, a warehouse in Dubai and whatnot. Then you can patronize the farmers here. You can be the one to aggregate them and whatnot. So that's on that side. And then they can pay the farmers as well instead of the foreigners coming and collecting the, our produce at a very ridiculous rate. So, and somebody asked another question that on standard and compliance, can any specific example be cited in terms of work? Nigerian for short. I'm going to go back to the ginger one. I'm, I'm citing examples that I'm personally aware of. Now, the off-taker also mentioned that he wanted um, this ginger oil. It should have maximum of 5% moisture. And then somebody is sending samples to us because our office is here, we easily collect samples, then we give it to the off-taker. And it has like 15% moisture. So even locally, if somebody tells you, I want a biscuit to be this dry, and you don't give what they've asked for, nobody's going to collect that product. And we have this habit of forcing it. It's good, it's the best, it's organic. We understand. But this optica wants X, Y, Z, um, what's it called, percentage of moisture. It's, you, you can say you can't do it or you don't have the facilities to do it. We have people who maybe they have the drying machine and whatnot. We can pass it on to them, they dry it, then we can export. But also a lot of product that we've collected, especially in Nigeria, we've had tough time, to be honest, with mostly Nigeria. I can tell I'm Nigerian and I'm telling you we have more. We tell people this is the specification needed. And then they send it to the office, it gets to Dubai. It is not. So even we you can see we reject samples. And after we've told you it should be this, it should be that. This is not even on certification now. This is on standard. This is what we want. We don't want this best. We don't want this. We don't want that. So I think, um, what's it called? We need to start following, because one of the, one of the, what's it called? Our theme is um, creating a sustainable future. We don't also want to be those people that do. That's why we can't say we, are, we want to start trading. We have people that, can, that have come to tell us, I have this, please send it to Dubai for me and whatnot. We don't want to do one-time trade. As Africans, we need to really stop things like that. You do a one-time trade and that's it. Let us have good partnership. Let us create sustainable partnership with our counterparts over there and continue doing business. If you deliver on the first, one of the reasons we got a lot of support from the Ministry of Economy, UAE, Dubai Chamber, and the Dubai government and everything is also consistency. And if we tell them this is what we are going to do, this is what we are going to do. Even it's only when we do these conferences in Africa, we start like, let's say 30 minutes late. But in Dubai, if you say we're going to start by 8 o'clock, little things like that goes a long way for them. So I think we need to really, we just say this compliance, we've met the, um, what's it called, the standard, but really we haven't. Because this is from personal and real experiences. That's why I mentioned Kenya, Rwanda, and Ethiopia, we've been doing good business with them. Even Ghana, to add to it, we've been doing, if, we, if you tell them you want this, they actually to an extent, and if they can't do it, they tell you that we are not able to do it. And coming back to the aspect of government, for example, for Rwanda, their government really supports them. And it's actually made a lot of things even easy for them. Even on export, they try to put a lot of subsidy. They go to Rwanda Air, and then they tell them, you are going to take this and this to Dubai for the farmers, but we want 30%. The government can say they'll pay 30% of the um, export cost. So it's easier for them, even for the conference, the National Agricultural Export Board of Rwanda, they were able to put their top you know, farmers together. Because the conference is not for all the farmers from Nigeria or from Africa to come. So the representative of each, okay, you, um, you have a lot of, you know, and Rwanda is small. They don't even have enough land. And it's even what they call land blocked. Like they are at more disadvantage and they are already trading with Dubai. So I believe that we still need a government as much as possible, even for logistics, for infrastructure. We still need them, but believe me, I believe Nigeria is ready. Because if you go to Dubai, when we are Dubai municipality, a lot of product that you see in Dubai, you see made in China, made in India. If you go to the Dubai municipality, the certificate of origin is Nigeria. A lot of our products, so of course we are ready. Our things are already leaving. Nigeria. So what, what do we mean by we are not ready? If our things are already there, but the thing is, it's not indigenous. And also our bilateral agreement with the UAE, it needs to get better, it needs to be stronger. Why is India and China 
and other countries really doing a lot of trade as well. Their government goes there every now and then and negotiates with them. This bilateral agreement on everything, so they have more access to uh, what's it called, market in the UAE. But I believe with the private sector, we shouldn't wait as well. Let's do the little that we can do. And I believe that is what Greenovate is doing as well. And I believe that is why every one of us, we are also here to do the little that we can do. And hopefully, I believe as well that the government will put their full force to support this. So I think that's the final question. So I think we've come to the end of the conference, and uh, I want to say thank you. I'm Bola Yedele, once again. I work with Greenovate Consulting. So well, I would really like to thank um, one of our biggest supporters from the UAE, that's the Ministry of Economy. They, they've been very, very supportive from the first day that we told them that uh, we want to go ahead doing this conference. I remember clearly I was with, I was in the ministry and I was telling them, oh, Africa can do this. So, and then the government was telling me, Madam, you are a private sector. We will not have conversation with you. We can't talk to you. Bring your government and then we'll talk to them. So that was where actually the passion came from. Of, okay, you know what, let's do a conference around this and whatnot. So they've been supporting Dubai Chamber as well. Dubai Chamber of Commerce, they've been um, very supportive as well. And then the Dubai Trade, the Dubai Export, and then Dubai Municipality, they are very supportive. Because at the end of the day, even when you come to Dubai, we still need to sit down with these people. We need to talk, we need to have MOUs with them, we need to negotiate with them. And the good thing about the UAE that is really fantastic, they actually make things work. I tell people, who am I to go to the Dubai Ministry, Dubai Chamber and whatnot. But if they see that you have a very good initiative and you really want to add value, they make everything possible for you. So it's because of them, this has actually been a sort of and a motivation for us to continue on this journey. And um, also our official partner, the MCC um, Free Trade Zone, they are the biggest um, free zone in the Middle East. Now, one interesting thing about DMCC, they've actually set up um, one of the best facilities for tea and coffee. That you can actually, if you have tea and coffee, you can take it to the DMCC, um, what's it called, commodity, uh, commodity center, and you don't have to pay for the space. They are the one that, they, are, they will even roast the coffee for you, and then they will get uptakers for the coffee and for the tea. That, that's what I've been saying that Rwanda. Um, Kenya and then um, Ethiopia will be quite successful with them. So they have that facility. I believe anyone who is into the tea and coffee business that um, can take advantage of that. And at no cost, they have the facility. Then is that after sale, then you know profit is shared and whatnot and, and all of that. So they have our official free trade zone partner, Ethiopian Airline as well. So we had to even talk to Ethiopian Airline when people want to, because they also complain that they come especially to Nigeria, their belt is empty. And then when they are going back, the belt is like, no, when they come, the belt is full. And then when they're going back, it's empty. And we tell them, let us take advantage of this. Because of course we know air cargo is very expensive. But what's the point of going back empty? Do some discounts. Make, we've been having those talks with them, even with Emirates Airlines and the rest of them. But we're able to come to like a concrete deal with Ethiopia Airlines, and that's why they partner with us. So, and other partners as well, the UAE African Networking Group, Farm Connect, um, Connect Nigeria, Ava Group, Farm Funded, PCFMU TV. And in Nigeria as well, I'd like to really thank the Ministry of Agriculture as well, the Federal Ministry. They've been supportive too since um, 2017. And then the Ministry of Trade as well, Dubai Chamber of Commerce, um, Lagos Chamber of Commerce, Nexen, BOA, Bank of Agriculture, Bank of Industry, NIPC, NABG, and our amazing friend and family member, Farm Crowdy. They've been amazing. And also every single person that is here today. I really can't mention everybody's name, but I'm really grateful. Thank you everyone for coming.